hopefully most of you in the audience are already using Atom. It's a text editor based on web technologies that we've been working on for a while. Our goal is to make something that's modern, customizable, and hackable to the core, but still approachable by people that want to be productive without customizing a thing. It's based on our Electron app framework, which is basically the guts of Google's Chrome browser integrated with the Node.js runtime. There's a lot of power and flexibility in that combination. Uh, I imagine that I don't need to tell you guys that. I probably already know. Uh, web developers can extend the editor using the front end tools they already know and uh, seamlessly use any of the thousands of available Node modules that are on NPM. And those have access to the system and can do anything that Node running on your system can normally do, which is obviously a bit beyond the powers of a typical browser. So the web platform is the most widely used and well-documented means to create software that exists today and probably has ever existed. So it made a lot of sense to us that our ideal editor of tomorrow will be built with these tools. The web has progressed a long way from its origins as a collection of documents and only documents, right? Like the early web was just text. And now it's an app platform. Uh, and by using Chromium, we get to take advantage of Google's great adoption and support of the latest additions to the web platform. You'll hear Elliot Sprain talk about web components later this morning. Uh, web components, uh, if you're not familiar with them, that should be really interesting. They're a great example of how Adam can take advantage of the web of tomorrow to build our editor of tomorrow. So the first uh, early beta version of Adam came out last year. We've learned a lot about what people want from the editor, as well as you know, how people want to customize their tools, what special use cases they have. We learned a lot about how to make a browser-based editor perform well and be customizable at the same time, which According to a lot of people, it was an impossible task, but you know, we're figuring it out, and uh, we really look forward to learning more about that. Uh, and fortunately, Adam is now, I work in, I'm up here, I'm representing the core team, and I work for GitHub, and we work for GitHub, but Adam has grown so far beyond the walls of GitHub into an open source project with an active and inspiring community, and the core team doesn't have to figure it out all on their own. Uh, the growth of this community is really inspiring. I want to share with you guys uh, some numbers that we have about the growth of Atom. Um, you know, I don't have any secrets in this room. Um, so this is active monthly users for Atom uh, ending last month. As you can see, uh, it's up and to the right. We're really excited about that. That's a lot of people that are depending on the editor for uh, their day-to-day -day tasks, whether it's writing Markdown or writing software. Um, and so, and these are, of course, just people that, that have metrics turned on. So let's just assume that, that real numbers are 10 times that. Um, but the, uh, the user base is only one story. The developer community and the customizations are perhaps even more interesting. And so since we released last February, uh, and I think uh, this probably go goes up into the right a bit more this month, because uh, like I said, this, this ends at the end of last month. But we've passed 2,000 packages for everything from, um, sorry, for everything from language support to you know, running linters, running uh, debuggers, all sorts of ways people have customized the editor. And then this is the, the count of themes that we have. I know uh, it's kind of similar up and to the right. Very excited about it. But anyway, as you can see, in a short time, the Atom community has racked up an impressive number of customizations, visual changes, themes. A lot of the people that have written some of these packages are, are in the room today um, to radical extensions that change a lot about how the editor works. An example of the latter is Facebook's new Clyde project. Uh, which is a collection of Atom packages that transform Atom into a new IDE entirely. And you'll be hearing more about that from Michael Bolin later today. Uh, anyway, packages are one way people around the world contribute to Atom. Themes are another. Uh, but lots of people contribute to the core Atom repository, the packages that make up its functionality, and the framework upon which it's built. So as you can see, uh, we've got nearly 1,000 people contributing in the, in the organization on GitHub. and you know, 100,000 commits in the, that make up the package index, and that's a lot of people coming together to improve their tools. The, kind of, the combined brain power of all these people, and hopefully a lot more people, hopefully some of you in this room that haven't co contributed yet, will help us really make Adam shine. Anyway, since Adam has announced the public, Adam has changed a lot. It's grown and improved in a lot of ways. But what about before it was announced to the public? Uh, a lot of you may not know that, you know, Adam existed within the walls of GitHub before uh, February of 2014. Uh, when Adam was announced, the core and the packages had thousands and thousands of lines of CoffeeScript and C++. So where did those lines of code come from? To tell you a little bit more about that, I'd like to welcome Chris Wanstroth, the CEO of GitHub and the originator of the Atom project stage.
Thank you, The Daniel. Hey, everybody. What's going on? Hello, Nashville. So who likes to mess with their editor? Has anyone ever? Yeah, a couple people? All right, all right. I do as well. Um, so I am Chris Wanstroth. I better known as defunct with a K. And if you've ever interacted with me online, I apologize for ruining your ability to spell that word properly ever again in your life. But uh, in about, let's say, 2007, I sort of had this idea that any piece of software that I didn't like, I was going to reinvent. Has anyone ever gone through that before? Right. Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Just like any tool that didn't feel right, I am I'm the most genius person on the planet. I can write uh, lines of code for a computer. I'm just going like, to redo it and make it better. Because uh, it's not like that there are people way smarter than me that have been working for decades on this stuff, right? This is uh, young and naive, let's say. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to fix and work on was a better way for people to work together. And this led me and some other people to create GitHub. And uh, at the time, it was a little bit different than it is today, but I think we're pretty, pretty good, doing pretty well on our mission to help people work together to build great software. And the other thing I really wanted to do was I wanted to help myself work better. And what better tool for helping yourself become more productive as a programmer than your editor? The problem is, is I know I said like I wanted to reinvent everything, but I really wanted to add on to an existing editor. I wanted to find like a solid foundation and go nuts writing plugins and extensions. Anyone know? T. Pope. I wanted to be the T. Pope of, of some editor. He's a, he does tons of Vim extensions and integrations and, uh, and things like that. He's made Vim amazing, right? So I started learning VimScript, and I was like, man, I'm just, I'm not T. Pope. This is not for me. A VimScript, it's just impenetrable, and it's a sandbox. You know, Vim is written in C. It's like five files. It's an it's amazing program if you ever have the chance to look at it. It's, it's very well done. But it's, it's a few files, it's this very strong, very well done core, and then there's an extension library, or extension language called VimScript that the core allows you to drive the editor. And that means that you only get as much power as the people writing Vim let you have. So you can't do something like, say, create collaboration because, like real-time collaboration, because the core editor only supports a single cursor. And that's not a knock against Vim, it just means your, your, your hands are tied as far as what you can do in an extension. If you wanted to create collaboration, you could probably make a pull request to Vim itself, but I don't know C, or I do know C, but I'm not allowed to write it because I would uh, create security vulnerabilities. So uh, Vim was not for me, uh, even though I loved it. I really, really was a big Vim fan. So I thought, okay, there's this Emacs thing. I've heard of it. I hear people making fun of it. I think it's like a competitor to Windows and Linux and Mac OS X. It's some sort of operating system. But I've heard that there's a component or a core part of it that lets you write code. So I started playing with Emacs, and there is a book written about Emacs. There's a couple, obviously. And one of them's written by ESR, er Eric Raymond. And in the first couple chapters, he's talking about how he uses Emacs to write his sci-fi fantasy novels. I'm just like, what is going on here? This is, <laughs> I, I would love to be a novelist one day, but my immediate concern is uh, balancing parentheses in Lisp and making sure that when I open a curly bracket in JavaScript that the closing curly bracket gets placed in automatically. So I got past a couple of the uh, fantasy chapters and got into the guts of Emacs and I just sort of fell in love. So if, you, if you've never really used Emacs, um, and I don't blame you for that, it's old. It's, um, it started out in the 80s. In fact, it was ported to GNU in 1985, but that's not to say it's bad because it's old, that's to say it's great because it's old. It's, it has staying power. Like, how many pieces of software that were written in the 80s are still used today? Probably just Emacs. No, there's, there's very few, right? How many pieces of software did you write last year that you don't even use anymore, right? So the fact that Emacs was so old was really compelling. There was something there. There was an idea, there was a concept, there was a technical innovation that was really amazing. And the, the deeper I dug into it, what I, what I started discovering was that Emacs was written in itself, or tries to be. That's the goal. And it's not 100% written in itself, but it's very close. And so what you have is the core of Emacs is a C program that's essentially a Lisp interpreter. And they have their own version of Lisp called Emacs Lisp, which we can talk about uh, if you want. It's not a real Lisp. But uh, they basically have this core Emacs Lisp interpreter, and then they write as much of the editor as they can in Emacs Lisp. And Aside from that being just like a fun thing to think about, what that means is if you're curious about how do cursors work in Emacs, or how does the indentation system work in Emacs, or I want to write a gist library, how does the networking work in Emacs? Well, you can go to the documentation, you can read the book that tells you how to write sci-fi novels in Emacs, or you can just go to the source. 
And me, I really like going to the source. I like looking at how the code is written. I like getting into the mind of another developer. And I like skipping the middleman in many ways. Like there's, there, there's one, it, there's a lot to be said for reading someone's uh, perspective on the source. There's another thing to be said for just reading it directly. So Emacs is great because not only do you read the source, the source browsing and debugging and discovery and exploration are built into the editor itself. So you're not just in Emacs and you're going to, to, to I was going to say GitHub, but uh, I think it's something else, CVS. You're not just in Emacs and then you're jumping to CVS or GitHub or whatever to look at the source. It's right there. You're, you're hovering over a function or a macro and you hit a key command and you go right to the source. There's documentation that's generated by the comments that are left in each, each list function. So you really feel like I am in this system. I am, I am deep in this system. If, you know, give it five more years and I can imagine plugging in like Oculus VR and just being like all the way in there like it's the matrix. You really felt like you are part of this thing. And while you're adding plugins or while you're writing extensions, you don't feel like you're in a sandbox. You don't feel like you're, you're in this like separate world. You feel like you're part of the core editor. And so that was really, really amazing. And I, I deeply fell in love with Emacs. It has a lot of faults, but I, I use it to build GitHub essentially and write a lot of code for the next five or so years. I love the editor. And it gave me a lot of really great inspiration. Um, the problem was honestly Emacs Lisp. And if you've ever worked with Emacs, you probably know, if, you ever, if you're a Lisp fan, you probably know where this is going. But Emacs Lisp is not a real Lisp because Lisp is all about recursion. And one of the problems with Lisp is that it's all about recursion. And one of the amazing things about Lisp is that it's all about recursion. And so the fact that you can't do recursion very well, Emacs Lisp sort of limits you. You're almost in this faux uh, uncanny valley world where you read the little schemer or you, you work in something today even like closure, and then you go to Emacs and you have to write for loops and while loops and if statements instead of being in this amazing world of recursion. So that was a problem. And then the other problem is, what is the point of Lisp without recursion? And I'm sorry to anyone that loves Emacs, but I loved it too, and yet it just felt a little bit like I was again stuck in that sandbox, or I again was stuck in that uncanny valley, where I was so close to getting the pure experience, but it wasn't there. So I'm thinking about this, and I'm working on um, projects, and I'm thinking that I'm going to reinvent the world. And one day I realized, and now remember, this is 2007, so what I'm about to say is, is, was controversial and insane. One day I said to someone, I think JavaScript isn't that bad, okay? And so <laughs> in 2007, that was an insane statement, and everyone looked at you like you were crazy. But, it, but there's this idea that even then, JavaScript was everywhere. There were, it was the, the most widely installed programming platform in the world, right? Because every browser has a JavaScript interpreter, uh, even though they're, they're, they're wildly different. And then, thinking on that, on that, that line of thinking, um, the, the JavaScript wars started. So this is when Squirrelfish came out. This is when Monkey whatever came out. This is when Chrome and Safari and Firefox started competing for JavaScript performance. And it really starts, I think, with the era of Gmail, right? Like Gmail was the first uh, really heavy JavaScript application that many of us use or the mainstream use. And so then that proved the JavaScript was slow and the VMs were not that great. And so Google put their, put, doubled down and said, we're going to make JavaScript super fast. And then everyone else sort of fell in line, right? And that's when you got this JavaScript wars, this performance wars. And you start getting like close to, let's not say native, but you don't get native speeds out of JavaScript in that era, but you have native attention. And the same people that are trying to make C fast and are trying to make things like, uh, like, like Scheme or any of these professional interpreters, people that worked on small tech, small talk. The same people that are trying to make those fast, now they're focusing on JavaScript. And it's gone from this toy language that's sort of built into a browser so you can make something blink or move or like make an ad pop up when you're trying to read a news article, to this is something that you can build real applications in. And even though that wasn't really true in 2007, 2008, it was still really hard to build JavaScript applications. They were still really slow. The fact that Google, the fact that Apple, the fact that Mozilla are trying to make it into something real, that gave, I think, a lot of people hope and inspired a generation of developers to think JavaScript could actually be a real tool. And it's a little bit more than you know, tracking what your, your user behavior is and fo fo following your cookies and things like that. Maybe this is a way to build real applications. P but one of the problems there was JavaScript was only a browser technology. As far as I know, um, there were very few, if any, server-side implementations at the time. And the ones that existed were just not stable. Uh, my friend John Barnett worked on one of them, and it was, it was trash. You can tell him I said that. But it was, it was not his fault. It was that 
it's so hard to take a JavaScript interpreter, put it on the server, and then script it, right? And really what you wanted was to write code in JavaScript just to see how it feels and to be able to write server applications and to treat this as a real programming language, which you were never able to do before because you were stuck in the browser. And so in Python or Ruby or Perl or even C, one of the first things you learn is how to open a file. And JavaScript is literally impossible because it's in a browser, right? So it's not a real programming language. And so again, it's like Lisp without recursion. Something is missing. However, there were some experiments. There were some people trying to take Mozilla's JavaScript engine and put it on the command line, John, John Barnett. And then uh, there were other experiments as well, which leads us to the idea that maybe you could actually build real applications in JavaScript. People are learning it, kids are learning it, everyone is using it every day. So you can see where this is going, right? So I'm talking to friends, we're thinking, and we're like, what if Emacs was built today? What would it look like? Well, if you read about the internals of Emacs, there's so much time and attention spent on like the event loop and all these and terminal sizes and all these concerns and problems in the 80s that you just don't even have or let's say no exist at all today, right? Like I don't know what an event loop is in terms of actually receiving key presses. Like if you're writing a native application, uh, Cocoa handles that for you, or .NET handles that for you. Those concerns are, have long gone. Now you're focusing on the application. But Emacs still had a lot of these concerns baked into it. So let's say 2007, 2008, let's say 2020, how would you build an editor? And one of the nice things about Lisp in the 80s was, A, it was dynamic. You didn't have to worry about typing and compiling all these things. But B, a lot of people knew it. A lot of people in the 80s were learning Lisp as they were learning uh, how to program. They would learn C, they'd learn Lisp alongside of it. So it was extremely popular, and it was sort of like a, lingua, like a, like a baseline for a lot of developers. That has changed, unfortunately. If you don't know Lisp, I highly recommend learning the, reading The Little Schemer. It's an amazing book, and it'll change your mind, hopefully for the better. But in 2007, 2008, I think the answer is, what is a programming language that's sort of like the foundation, the baseline? And the answer was quickly becoming JavaScript. So Emacs Lisp in 2008, or let's say 2020, what would that look like? It would look like A, something written in JavaScript, B, as much of it possible written in JavaScript, C, why would you want to learn Coco or .NET's windowing system when you already know HTML and CSS, and D, let's assume that there's a network. Because one of the things that you didn't have in the 80s was, let's say, the internet as we have it today, right? I mean, there, it did exist, but not the same way that it looks today. When, in 2007, 2008, when Adam was just being started, there was 1.5 billion people on the internet. Today, there's three. So in seven years, the internet has doubled from 1.5 billion people to three. So like, let's just assume that there's a network, right? We all have a network connections in our pocket. What does that actually do to your editor? When every time you open it, you can reasonably assume that you're connected to everyone. And Emacs, it's sort of tacked on. Vim, it's tacked on. What if we built that right in from the start? So we started playing with um, building a Mac OS X application, and you can see it here. This screenshot was actually taken uh, a couple weeks ago. If we still have it, we're going to make it available for you to download. What we started playing with was this thing we called atomicity. And we called it that because, I don't know, it was a new word and it was interesting. And then internally, we have like a neutron library and a proton library, which you've all probably gone through, and it's a horrible idea. It was confusing. But the idea was let's write a Mac application and let's expose as much of the native technologies as we can to JavaScript through APIs and let's build the application in JavaScript. And so in 2007, 2008, this was possible because uh, the Mac stuff, Coco, had a bridge through WebKit, through their JavaScript core, into native technologies where you could surface Objective-C functions as JavaScript functions and call them. Um, and so we actually got a, lo a lot done. We got, uh, we, this is basically a web page that can open files, can save files, can close files. The syntax highlighter was an open source project we got off the shelf. Uh, the indenting was an open source project that we got off the shelf. You can open it, you can see the different options there. It recognized files. But the problem was uh, there were a lot of bugs. The, the JavaScript bridge between Coco and um, JavaScript itself was very buggy. We had this idea of, well, how are we going to do like a sidebar? Let's use frames. We can use HTML for everything. But you didn't have the same context available in each frame. You couldn't really drive that from JavaScript. So it was really frustrating because the whole point of this was I don't know native stuff. I suck at it. Like I've read books and I can make this work, right? But I'm not a native developer. I'm a web developer. Um, and I'm running into all of these barriers that are preventing me from writing the application in JavaScript. So now I'm becoming this Objective C, not expert, I want to say, but student. And like this is, this is not the point. The point is to ignore Objective C. The point is to ignore C Sharp. The point is to focus on JavaScript. 
Also, I had this thing going on at the time, which was called GitHub.com, which we were bootstrapping, and it was still in the first year. And so this became more and more of a, uh, it seemed like a big undertaking. So we thought, th th this is going to be inevitable. There is going to be an editor that's going to be written in JavaScript. It's going to be network aware. It's going to let you log in to the editor, and not in a creepy Quora way where you have to log in to use it, but an awesome like social way of you can log in, you can have connections to people, you can share code. Like There's a lot of awesome stuff you get from a web browser. What if you got that from a native piece of technology as well, specifically one that you're using 8 to 12 to 29 hours a day to write code, right? So we said, OK, we're going to table atomicity, even though the name is great and the electron proton thing really, really makes sense to people. And we're going to focus on GitHub, and someone else is going to do this for us. Someone else is going to eventually write a JavaScript editor. Um, and so the reason we're here today is because that didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> so we worked on GitHub, we focused on GitHub, and you know, there, were, there, there are some that have come out. Brackets is awesome from Adobe. There are some in this direction, but really the way the world went was trying to build text editors in a web browser. I don't know how many of you do your full-time coding in a web browser, but I'm guessing it's not a lot, right? OK, uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what you want are the web technologies. What you want is JavaScript. What you don't want is to hit Command D and accidentally bookmark the tab you're in. You want all of your keyboard shortcuts dedicated to the craft of programming, not to managing a browser. You also don't want to, like, leave your MySpace tab open and have it eat up your RAM and then crash your editing session. It doesn't make any sense, right? There's a reason that we have different applications in different contexts. So what we wanted was web technologies running in a native, isolated environment, and it just wasn't happening. However, because people were working on building text editors into the web browser for some reason, I mean, I'm being pre pretty harsh here, but I've tried it. I wanted to believe. It just doesn't work. Uh, there were a lot of really great editing technologies built in JavaScript in, in HTML, in CSS. And one of them is called ACE. The people at Cloud9 did a phenomenal job with this editing technology called ACE. And another one was called Code Mirror. And they're really good. They're fast, they're performant. They, they, they feel like a real web, they feel like a real editing technology. You wouldn't really know that they're built in the web. So we actually integrated ACE into GitHub. And so if you go to a file on GitHub and you would edit, and it is a programming file as opposed to markdown or text or something, It'll try to figure out what the programming language is, and it'll launch into that mode in ACE. So Ruby, it'll do like two indents or whatever, and it'll color appropriately. Python, it'll, you know, it'll indent for you appropriately and things like that as well. And so one night in 2011, I was, uh, well, that's not true. Actually, I gave a presentation to the company about, uh, internally at GitHub, about the new ACE technology that we were using. And what I showed off was collaboration, which we had built into GitHub but never shipped. And, uh, I was showing, like, what if you could collaboratively edit files on GitHub with someone else, which doesn't really make a lot of sense yet, but uh, we'll see where this is going. And I got a text that night from someone who worked at GitHub named Corey Johnson, and he had worked on the original Atomicity. There was a small user group of mailing lists, and he said, oh, you got to the end of your presentation, and it was collaboration built into GitHub.com. I thought you were going to show off a new version of Atomicity. And I was like, wow, that's really fascinating. I haven't thought about that in a while. I've been waiting for someone else to do it. Um, maybe we should, we should give that a shot. I was like, why? But, but, I mean, would that be any good? Is that something that people would want? And he was like, yeah, no, everything sucks. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to reinvent everything every day. And I just, uh, I really want to use a, an awesome editor that feels right. So we, we started uh, working at night, and we, in very little time, created an OS X application that was basically a web view with Ace inside of it. And like, that's it. Like, that's all, all you need. Like, all the heavy lifting was done for us. By this point, JavaScript had gotten super fast. The bridge had gotten super sophisticated. Some, a group of open source developers had created this amazing editor in web technologies. All I had to do was my dream, just glue a bunch of stuff together and take all the credit, right? So what, what happened was we realized this could be a real thing. You could actually build an editor in web technologies that ran natively that you could open and save and just work like Emacs, work like Vim, except it wouldn't just be, oh, well, Lisp is gone, now there's JavaScript. You would have the network. You would have Ajax available to you, and you wouldn't have the single domain restriction. You could make potentially Ajax calls to any site on the internet, and in addition, in 2011, there is GitHub, right? And I know I'm biased, but the, the community is so much stronger in 2011 than it was in 1985 or even 2007. What if there was a, a rich package ecosystem where we could create 
customizations and extensions to the editor, and we could share them, and we could iterate on them, and we could work on them together. Like, there are a lot of things that we can do now, building an editor in 2011, that we could have never imagined in 1985 because the world has changed. And we can build on top of these innovations and these new technologies to make the editor better. And so that's what we started working on. So we worked on Atomicity for a while, and uh, the way that it became Atom was, we were like, man, when you launch TextMate from the command line, you just write mate, and that's like, cool. So what are we gonna write on the command line? Well, let's just write Adam. We're like, well, why do we have all these other letters? Let's just get rid of them. Adam's cool, we're gonna call it that. Uh, there is an XML thing called Adam, but no one remembers that either. So we thought, okay, we're gonna rename this Adam. We're gonna start working on it, Corey and I, nights and weekends. And we think this is not just like a crazy idea anymore. We think this could be a GitHub thing. We think this is something that is core to GitHub's mission of helping people build great software. And it's core to the ideas of community, great tools, and an ecosystem. Like this fits in directly with what we're trying to do with our day job, essentially. So we, um, created a demo video of Adam, and really the demo was mostly uh, style over substance, but what we wanted to do was show what was possible. We showed opening a gist and saving it, and when you save it, it saves directly to gist API instead of locally. We showed uh, being able to change fonts and colors with CSS, and then we showed there's this asteroids thing, uh, bookmarklet, that when you load it, it creates a little spaceship and you can, you can fly it around and you can shoot and destroy elements of a web page. Like, you can blow up the CNN logo or things like that. So the finale of the Adam demo video is we load this Asteroids game into your editor and you're shooting lines of code and files and it's like, wh why would you ever do this? It's so confusing and what is happening right now. But that was the point, is that you can do anything you want, right? And that gives you a lot of rope and you are perfectly capable of making bad decisions, but that also means you're capable of making good decisions too. And so while the uh, Erky uh, plugin has been recreated in Atom, that's not the core of it. The core of it is stuff that we're talking about today. It's Turn, it's Linters, it's Minimap. It's this amazing community that has been building packages on top of Atom that's way broader and way deeper than a core team of engineers could ever do at their day jobs, right? The Atom community is really what makes Atom amazing, and it's driven by some really, really great people that work for GitHub and that don't work for GitHub as well. So, Coincidentally, I was at the one million user party uh, for GitHub in October of 2011. We were celebrating our one millionth user. The other day, we, last week, we actually hit our 10 millionth user, so things have changed slightly. And um, the rumor was out that like, there's like a thing coming from GitHub that's written in web technologies. And I ran into someone there, I was introduced to someone there named Nathan Sobo. And Nathan, I knew from way back in the day, he had expressed to me at one point wanting to write an editor in Ruby for a lot of the same reasons I wanted to write an editor in JavaScript. And he was like, yo, uh, someone told me I should talk to you. I don't know why. Uh, so we went and got coffee and we started hanging out. And I was like, whatever happened to your editor? And Nathan's trying to pitch me on writing an editor in Ruby. And in the back of my head, this is all happening, but I'm like trying to be coy about it. I was like, yeah, but like, what about JavaScript, right? And he's like, nah, it'll never work. It'll never work, right? <laughs> so we started hanging out a bunch more and eventually, got to a point where Nathan was himself convinced of the power of building something in JavaScript. And then I was like, okay, 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 well, let me show you what we're working on. And so we unveiled this demo to the company, we hired Nathan, we started this R&D project called Adam, Corey and Nathan went full time on it, and that was basically at the beginning of 2012. And really that's when I step out of it, because like I've been saying, I'm like, I'm pretty busy with this GitHub thing. <laughs> and Adam has always been a huge, huge dream of mine and something I want to use and I want to build, but I'm, 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 I don't know how to write an editor. I don't know native technologies. I don't know how to make things fast. Like, what I specialize in is not building Atom, it's using Atom. And so the team took it over. Uh, they eventually made it open source, and I'm so, so excited to be here today to be celebrating the 1.0 release of Atom, because for me, this has been like a seven or eight year dream. And it just goes to show you, like, Sometimes you just gotta do it yourself. <laughs> like other people, if they're, not, if they're not there, if they're not doing it for you, um, it's not that you should rely on other people to do things for you, it's if that they don't, what you should do is you start it and then you bring them in. Like communities build great software, communities build great products, and the Atom community is really its strongest feature. And so I guess I just wanna end with saying, um, Emacs is amazing because it's been around since the 80s. Vim is amazing because it's been around since the 80s as well. Atom is gonna outlive all of us. Atom is open source. Atom is a product of the community. GitHub is a corporation. I hope it'll be around for hundreds of thousands of years, 
but I have no doubt in my mind that Atom will be around forever. Like, open source just doesn't die. It'll outlive all of us, and that's an amazing thing. And today, we are just at the beginning of what this thing is going to become. We've just laid the foundation. We're still just focusing on making a good editor experience. But what we have is something that's accessible to any developer on the planet that knows web technologies or JavaScript, something that anyone can extend and share their creations with the world, and something that is network aware. Like, the whole world today is all about the network. We are all connected through the internet. And edit Adam is the first editor that truly understands that and speaks that. And I haven't seen a single package that has embraced that yet. We don't even know yet what's going to happen to Adam. And I am so confident in this because, for me, this is the story of GitHub. What you all do with GitHub, what the community has done with GitHub, what you build on it, what you do work with together, I, I could have never imagined that when we were building the website. All we wanted to do was create a fast, easier way to work together. And the community has just blown us away with what they've done on top of GitHub. And that is where we're at today with Adam. We're dreaming about what the community is going to do, but, but we can't even dream big enough. Because what people are going to build with Adam is going to blow all of us away. And I'm not even talking about five years from now. Imagine 20 years from now. This thing is going to be absolutely amazing and absolutely huge because it's open source and because it's community driven. And that's the key to building great software. So, Thank you all for, uh, for listening to me ramble. I'm, I'm just like so excited to be here today and so excited to see Adam 1.0 ship. And I just want to give a huge round of applause to the Adam team for really making this happen and the community. So thank you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And thank you for your service in the JavaScript wars. We all appreciate that. Uh, I love that story of Adam's early days. I actually maybe even like Adam Missy more than Adam, but we made these stickers and these t-shirts. So we're going to stick with Adam uh, for the name, I think. Uh, but like Chris said, we're going to put the original Adam Missy build up for download as a historical curiosity. And then you can download and see how far we've come. Um, so I joined the Adam team around when Chris deleted Emacs, maybe shortly after, after seeing a fascinating demo, kind of like the one he described. Um, I was going to go into detail uh, about another anecdote about the growth of Adam, but I think Chris covered quite a bit of what I wanted to say. Uh, so anyway, I'll just sort of bring us to the uh, original release of Adam. We were a small team, and we could polish. And what, like Chris was saying, Emacs is a 30-year project. Adam could be a 30-year project. We were sitting in a room trying to polish it and make it perfect, and we realized that we could do it forever. And we needed a release date. So. We uh, brought it under the umbrella of R&D at GitHub, and we said, OK, it's coming out on this day, February 26th, which was my 32nd birthday, coincidentally, I think. Uh, we weren't sure how the world was going to respond. We were thinking maybe we're going to be overwhelmed with feedback. There's only four or five of us. We went with this invite-based release. It got a lot of attention, and it was super overwhelming. But like Chris was saying, the open source community really adopted it. It was really inspiring. We open the beta test and open source to all of Atom. At that point, uh, Atom was no longer just a GitHub R&D project. I mean, GitHub employs the core team, but we're only a handful of folks, like you saw earlier uh, on the slides that I showed at the beginning. Uh, and the community makes Atom what it is today. It's this crowd of motivated, smart people with all kinds of different ideas about what they want from their tools, hobbyists, startup employees, students, uh, novices, writers, like you name it. And since the release, a lot of important core features and changes in Atom, things that we didn't even consider, uh, have started this project entirely outside of the walls and outside of our team. And uh, anyway, it's not easy to make something that satisfies such a large group with such diverse and strongly held opinions. But uh, our technical philosophy, now Chris kind of talked about sort of the overarching philosophy and concepts behind uh, of what Atom is at a very high level. But, uh, sort of the technical philosophy of how we decided to build Atom sort of in the modern, mature, post-Atomicity era, uh, combined with the community's organic approach to collaboration, has helped us move in the right direction, right? So uh, I don't want to ramble on too much about that. I just want to welcome uh, Ben Ogle from the Atom core team. And he's going to come to the stage and talk in detail more about the community and philosophy of Atom. All right. All right, hey everybody. Okay, so what is the perfect editor? So our goal with Adam is not to hand you the perfect editor, because, because that's impossible. So the perfect editor is a really personal thing. It depends heavily on context. Like, 
Like let's say, let's say I write code, I write front end code for websites, and you write systems code and Go. Uh, our needs are totally different. So like we on the core team, and uh, or really anyone writing an editor, we can't know all of the intricacies and all the nuance of of what what everyone needs. Uh, for example, like I don't write any Go code, so so I don't know what tools Go authors need. So like how do we make how do we make an editor that works for everyone? So like like Chris touched on. Uh, it's with community. So we want to we want to build a community that enables the people who want better tools and who are uh, who have the domain specific knowledge to write those tools. Just like uh, like I don't know Go, but somebody in this room does. Joe Fitzgerald. He wrote the Go the Go Plus package. Uh, so the bigger goal of Adam isn't just to build a product. It's to build a community with Adam just at the center. Uh, so there's a ton of smart, motivated people who write code and who want tools for writing code, or who, who want better tools for writing code. So what we want to do is we just want to get all those people pointed in the same direction uh, and, and, and help them work together to solve these problems for themselves. So we want to build a community, but, but how do we build a community? So it seems like communities work best when there is a, when there's a common foundation. So it's a foundation that everyone agrees on, just like we're all going to speak English to each other today, or we're all going to spend dollars like the local cafes. But the problem is, like, getting people to agree is super hard. It's really expensive. It's really hard. So here's an example from, from Node.js. This is a pull request. This changes url.parse.protocol to return HTTP, HTTP instead of HTTP colon. So it's removing the colon. It's a two-character change. It's, and, and it has 124 comments that span four months. So, like, all these people spent tons of time and energy fighting for their opinion. Uh, there was like anger, there's frustration, there was a, a pic picture of a bike shed in there. But it ultimately it didn't get merged. So this isn't the node maintainer's fault. It's just that making something that intersects like everyone's opinions is really, really difficult. Uh, so this node example might seem extreme, but I'm sure everyone in this room has felt, uh, has felt this at some point, where you, you want to get something in, but it takes a week of emails and back and forth even just to get started. So, like, with Adam, we want to avoid this expense as much as we can. So, like, as a developer community, what are the things that we can agree on? Like Chris touched on, like, what's, what's the most popular developer platform in the world? It's the web. It has all of these companies, like, getting behind JavaScript and, and web, web technologies. So it's the web. And so I bet everyone in this room knows HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Or, or, and, if they, and if you don't, like, there's lots of materials out there to learn it. Uh, so by anchoring to the web platform, we also get longevity. So web browsers, they're probably not going away. We, they have, there's tons of companies that are getting behind them. Uh, and browser vendors are really careful to, to add things that are only like, useful in the long term. And so since we're using the web platform, we're using JavaScript, uh, like, let's use Node. Let's use Node.js. And once we use Node, all of a sudden we get all of these packages. We get thousands of packages that are already written. We can just use them. So that's consensus. Uh, we're using all these technologies that the developer community has already chosen. And, so, and that's really powerful. We can just build on top of that. So here's some examples. This is Atom Turn JS. And what this does is it, it, uh, it gives you autocomplete suggestions in JavaScript. And this isn't just like pulling words out of the buffer. It's actually figuring out like what are the functions, what are the variables, and like what are those functions return, what are the, the parameter types and stuff. Uh, and so the, the, the core of this is, is this Node module called Turn.js. And Turn.js does all the heavy lifting. And so because we use Node, all we have to do is wrap this in an Atom package. And we kind of, we kind of get it for free. So that, that's awesome. So the next one is regex railroad diagram. This thing parses your regular expressions and, uh, and, and, and displays them in graphical form. So again, we're using a Node module called railroad diagrams. And, uh, all Railroad Diagrams does is it, is it pulls in your, your regular expression and outputs an SVG diagram. Because we're using the web platform and Node, we can, we can display the output of, uh, of that Node module. And so the most important example is Kitty Detect. Kitty Detect detects cat faces in cat, uh, in cat pictures. So you could even hook up the Web Audio API and, and, uh, and write, a, write a theremin for your cat, and your cat can play music. So I mean, it's important stuff, but uh, it's super easy to do in Atom because there's a node module called KittyDAR, and KittyDAR does the heavy lifting of actually detecting the cat faces. 
So I just want to emphasize like all of the things that we're piggybacking on here. We have HTML, we have CSS, we have JavaScript. Uh, we're using Canvas to display the, the rectangle around the cat face. We're using Canvas in the minimap. We're using the shadow DOM in the editor. We're using web components. We're using Node. We're using NPM. There's like tons of stuff that we just get to use. So this is consensus. This is consensus that is like the result of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and like angry comments on the internet um, from the developer community and standards people. So that's one part of the foundation. It's the tech stack. Um, we get a lot of power and familiarity by, by, like, by using the technologies that everyone has agreed on. So the next part of the, the community foundation is, is the thing that we build on top of, of this tech stack. It's Atom Core. So it's not the core like the default distribution like the, the tabs and the tree view, but it's, it's like the API and the package system. So remember that consensus is difficult and it's expensive. So with Atom Core, we want to like we want to limit that. We want to limit the surface area as much as we can, so that uh, so there's just less that we have to agree on. So we just focus on the primitives and we focus on the general case in Atom Core. And then we build consensus in Atom Core by uh, by keeping it open source and letting it be shaped by thousands of contributors or hundreds of contributors. I'm sorry. Um, and so these contributors have ranged from people making their first pull request ever to like professional developers like the Facebook team, the Nuclei team of Facebook. So like that's the community foundation. It's Atom Core, or it's web platform on the bottom and Atom Core on top. And this is the thing that the community can sort of can rally around. But beyond that, everything else is packages. So like nearly everything that you interact with is a package. Like everything in there, it's all green. <coughs> The only thing that you're not interact or th that's not a package in this is the the editor component itself, and the pane in the panel system. But everything else, finer place and tabs and the minimap and everything is a package. <coughs> so when everything is a package, this is where it gets interesting because packages allow for divergence, and divergence is important because then we don't need to agree on every little detail. You don't need to go into core and ask for something. You can just you can just hack it together and you can throw it up on the package store for anyone to use who wants to use it. So this is super valuable. Like Daniel pointed out, there's over 2,000 packages. There's like, can't live without packages, like linter, there's the minimap. Um, there's even abandoned packages like atom term, which is a terminal. Then there's like packages that replace the abandoned packages, like atom term 2. There's three Python autocomplete providers. There's five Git clients. Um, then there's like Facebook and particle.io who are building their IDEs on top of atom. So this divergence in competition is really, is really great. Uh, packages they can they can like share ideas and they can break apart and they can recombine and they can compete, and so it's like a it's like a true ecosystem where like specialized niches can form and the strongest and most interesting things they sort of they sort of rise to the top. So one example is is autocomplete or autocomplete plus. So this was the original autocomplete we that we bundled uh, in the first version of Atom, but no one knew it was there because you had to hit Control Space to make it show up. And so we got tons of issues that were like, you guys should make autocomplete. And we're like, we have it. Turns out you just had to hit control space. Uh, and so right after we, we launched, somebody forked autocomplete and they created autocomplete plus. Autocomplete plus had like better, it had better suggestions. It showed while typing, which was huge for users. And it was extensible. So users immediately downloaded it because they didn't know that we had autocomplete. Uh, and then developers got behind it because it's extensible. So they started writing these providers for their specific language. So at this point, autocomplete was totally winning. It was, it was, it was beating our default autocomplete. But then, in the twist of plot, uh, developers, they, they needed an asynchronous API. So that the uh, autocomplete plus API was synchronous. And so a lot of these like suggestion tools out there, like those suggestion tools uh, that, that they're just like a binary or a server, and you send them you send them a file and like a position in that file, and they'll send you suggestions back. But they're servers or binaries, and so you have to actually like, for example, our sense in Ruby or our sense for Ruby is a server, and so you send it a post request, and then you get the suggestions back. And if you do that w with the synchronous API, you're going to lock up the UI, and so the, the the user's like you know typing and it's just freezing the UI, so it's really irritating. Uh, so they needed an, an, an async API. So this other package came out called Autocomplete Plus Async. Uh, and because of the package ecosystem, like, there's no consensus. Nobody needs to agree. It can just sort of come out, and then developers can immediately write packages against it, and users can immediately download it. 
so then this package, it led to, uh, it led to talk about, like, unification. It's like, we're all doing the same things. Like, let's sort of get pointed in the same direction. And uh, so the async API was added into Autocomplete Plus, and at that point, like, Autocomplete Plus had totally won, so we, so we bundled it. And this is the beauty of the organic model. Like, if we had baked Autocomplete Plus into core, or Autocomplete into core, like, none of this could have happened. Autocomplete Plus would have never have existed. Uh, probably there would have been this issue that looked like this. It was just like, improve Autocomplete, please fix, you know? And then there would be plus one comments. And then more plus one comments. And then, like, a whole bunch of plus one comments. Then there'd be, like, angry, lots of comments. Holy crap. And then, I mean, it's just war, right? <laughs> Terrible. So, so then this is just the beginning. So like everyone would, would sort of put their opinions and then we have to build something and then we have to go through this process like for every iteration. But with the organic model, we don't have to do that. As a package, it can just start small and sort of take shape over time. So this is how we see Atom evolving in the future. But like the best and most interesting things, they just, they just bubble up to the top and they can eventually become uh, or get bundled in the default distribution. So again, like Chris was saying, the way that we think about Atom is not just a product. It's, it's a community with Atom at the center. So we want Atom to be around for a really long time. And for that to happen, uh, the community needs to transcend us. It needs to be, it needs to be a self-guided community. And this is already happening. So we have several community maintainers who I can see in the audience here. We have Lee Dom who manages the forum. Uh, so these, these people, they, they fix issues, they merge PRs, they help us get PRs ready to be merged, they convince us to add or fix things, they help with issue triage, they, and they manage the forum, which, by the way, has tripled in traffic since the launch yesterday. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Mark Hahn, for dealing with that. Um, and then package-wise, the community's taken on huge features like the linter and the minimap. They've created IDE-level features like... Uh, around specific languages like Go Plus and Atom TypeScript and OmniSharp Atom and IDE Haskell. And like every one of these packages has their own community. So like Linter, uh, the commu Linter community has created 75 linters for, sorry, linters for 75 languages. And this, is only, this has only happened in, in one year, this, this community has, has blossomed so much. So we're really excited about that. Um, so what is Atom 1.0? So it's all the things I, I, I talked about. We have the tech stack at the bottom. We have Atom Core on top of that. We've got a bunch of packages, all the packages you interact with, all the packages you can download. But, but the most important part is the community. And it's the promise that Atom's going to be around, like Chris said, for a really long time because it's guided by the community, because we're not, you know, we're just the shepherds. So another way to visualize Atom 1.0 is like this. this is the, it's, it's the foundation but, but it's the foundation of what? You know, of, of course we're going to like continue to polish the core editor experience. We're going to continue to improve import, or performance. These things are really important to us. We're going to improve stability. Uh, we're going to add real international support. But what about big picture stuff? Like what, what, what can we do with this thing? Like Chris said, also, uh, to some degree we don't know because the community is, has, has done a lot of things that we weren't anticipating. Autocomplete Plus, we weren't anticipating. Nuclei, we weren't anticipating. Like, the linter, none of these things we, uh, we knew were coming. So, but we do have some ideas where we want to take it, and they look like the Burj Khalifa. <coughs> so, so some of the things we're thinking about are like, what does really deep Git integration look like? Like, what does social coding mean in your editor? What if we had the entirety of the GitHub community in your editor? What does that mean? What does that give you? Um, and also, we want to see more things like IDE Haskell and like Go Plus and Nuclide come up. So, like, how do we enable those people to write IDE level features? Uh, how do we enable them to write IDE level features with like by building frameworks for them, like the Linter and like Autocomplete Plus? So, 1.0 is just the foundation of all of these things. So, I'm going I'm to bring Daniel back up to talk about uh, what does 1.0 mean for developers and users. Thank you. That was awesome. Thanks, Ben. That was awesome. Uh, totally inspired. Tears welled up in my eyes at certain points. Uh, I know that we're running over time a little bit, so I'm going to kind of close it up here. Uh, so, Adam 1.0. Ben talked a lot about what Adam 1.0 means, what it can mean for you in the future, uh, where it's going, like, 
kind of asked you to help us build this giant, beautiful building. But uh, let's talk about nuts and bolts about what Atom 1.0 means, because 1.0 means different things for a software project, for an open source community, uh, you know, for a piece of hardware or whatever. So what, for us, for this project, does Atom 1.0 mean? Uh, let's start about uh, talking about what it means for the developer that wants to work on or extend Atom. Uh, the various entry points for customizing Atom that are available today are very different from what we shipped with early last year. Uh, at that point, we had exposed functionality that was necessary for the features we built and the features that we could imagine, not just imagine, but that we had planned to build in the near future. Like, here's our to-do list. We got the APIs for it. Let's do it. But as Ben and Chris both said, we, we, don't, we didn't know then, and we d still don't know now what uh, people wanted exactly, what they wanted to build, uh, what their goals were. So over the last year, uh, the community helped us discover a lot of novel use cases and uh, help serve, and people came from a lot of various uh, diverse technical communities. We learned a lot about what kind of patterns preserve editor performance, because as these needs change and peop we, people use the APIs heavily or less heavily, there are performance ramifications. So we learned about what kind of patterns uh, hurt editor performance and like how we could guide people in the right directions with the APIs. We found places where the APIs could be more consistent, where one set of methods implied another, uh, where 100 people filed plus one comments trying to customize something specific. So, um, oh, whoops. Pardon me. Um, anyway, throughout this process, uh, as Ben talked about, the package ecosystem exploded. Along with that, thousands of unique configurations blossomed. People depended on a wide range of packages uh, to do their work, and these packages depended on the APIs that were available the day that the person released their package. So uh, Adam had a major version starting with zero, so per semantic versioning, we're allowed to break the APIs, but we knew that wasn't an option, because even pre-1.0 people were depending on Adam to do work. We introduced a deprecation system and tools to help users and developers know if the package they'd built or depended on would have issues in the future. It was really difficult to coordinate, but it was the right thing. And so the community came together to update their packages to 1.0 standards that represent all the things that we learned about performance and what people wanted and what like the right way to customize an editor without stepping on some other package's toes was. So it's, that's great for code quality and performance for us and for this world of code that we don't control. So with 1.0, we declare the current package API stable. And like that's the core of what it means to developers. That is to say, any package you write today written to the public API is guaranteed to work without modification for the entire 1.0 line, long may it run. Uh, it doesn't mean that we won't add new and improved or experimental tools uh, for developers that want to extend Atom, but it does mean that we're making a public commitment to the package developer community and anyone here that wants to develop a package that if you follow the docs, your package will work and your package will benefit from the ongoing performance work that we do. So uh, that is what it means to developers. What does it mean to users? Uh, 1.0 represents the end of the pre-release or beta period. And uh, that means that we believe that Atom is ready to be the only editor on your system for most developers. There are, of course, edge cases here and there, and tools that we want to build yet that might not get that 1% case. But we think for 99%, Atom's all you need. I mean, it's all I've needed for 18 plus months, two years. Performance is good. It's only getting better. Uh, we're listening to your feedback and adding features that people consider must-haves. And honestly, everybody's got a different must-have feature, right? So we've added a lot of them. <laughs> and there are, more, there are more coming in 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, and, and so on. So whether you want to modify Atom or whether you want to use Atom, uh, Atom 1.0 is ready for you. Uh, I'm, I think uh, we should wrap it up. I'd like to close this session with something special from the folks in GitHub's video department. Uh, and thank you and enjoy. GitHub presents. Atom 1.0 in the home of tomorrow. After a long day of work, Dad unwinds in his study. He's using Atom 1.0, a fully modern text editor that's hackable to the core. A tool that you can customize to do just about anything. Looks like Dad's using Atom to rewrite the house's temperature regulation protocols. Since he writes a lot of JavaScript, he's installed Atom Turn and the JavaScript linter. He no longer makes mistakes and has increased his productivity by 50%. Nice job, Dad.
Mom is a programmer for the Alpha Centauri project, where she uses Adam every day. She's writing the software that will help direct the first rocket ship to carry humans to other solar systems. She can even work on Adam at home, continuing to work without missing a beat. With built-in Git support and the Minimap package, she keeps track of all the work she's done and the changes she's yet to commit. That's keeping her eye on the big picture. Junior wants to be a rocket ship engineer as well. So when mom's done working, she encourages him to work on his own projects. Like mother, like son. Adam is based on JavaScript, and so it's easy to use for everyone. It's fully customizable, conforming to whatever your needs might be. Hmm, seems like Junior's having some trouble. Maybe grandma can help. Though she might need to adjust a few things first. Yes, no matter how you prefer to work, Adam is there for you. Adam will get to know you, will speak your language, and will become a valuable member of the family. Introducing Adam 1.0, a text editor for the home of tomorrow, today.